The Team Never Quit podcast is sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. At Navy Federal Credit Union, every day is Veterans Day. Learn more at NavyFederal.org slash veteran. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Team Never Quit podcast. We've got a great guest lineup for you guys today. But before we do that, we like to kick these things off with our Patreon question of the day. We're actually going live on our Patreon today. I know you're not going to be you know, knowing that when you listen to this episode because I'll be weeks in the future. But still, <laughs> we're going live. That's one of the cool things about our Patreon is that we do stuff like that. Today's Patreon question of the day is, if you could have lunch with anyone in the world, who would it be? Benjamin, you want to kick this off? Oh, that's a great question. Dead or alive? Could be either. Could be either. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I know who I would want to have lunch with. I'd go with uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a, a, a priest, well, a Lutheran priest, who stood up um, against the Nazis during World War II, was eventually imprisoned in a concentration camp and hung with a piano wire. But he was responsible um, for being part of Operation Valkyrie, which was the assassination attempt uh, against Adolf Hitler, and just has a unbelievably fascinating life. Why they haven't made a movie about that guy yet uh, is is kind of beyond me. So love to have have lunch with that guy. That I don't know if you could beat that. <laughs> that sounds I don't think really so. cool. I've yeah. never heard of him. I need to look him up. What about you, babe? We're excluding the Almighty. Yeah. Almighty excluded. Yeah. <sighs> I mean, unless you want to go Jesus in human form. There you go. If we're going to go biblical, I'm He going, started it. I, if we're going <laughs> so biblical, I'm hit, that's why I said almighty. Well, I'm just going to go have dinner with the almighty then. If we're going go. biblical, or, or, or lunch, would, how about with the 12? Have lunch hey, with the I was going to say, oh, yeah. Yeah. a real last supper. <laughs> a last supper. Yeah. If we're going biblical, I want to have lunch with Mary. Yeah, yeah. Okay. She was I there. Get, yeah, well, oh, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. I just want to have a one-on-one with Mary and just... Which Mary, though? Mother, Mary. Yeah. Mother, oh, yeah, Mary. Mother, Mary. Mother Mary. Mother Mary. Okay, Mother Mary. Yes, I want to know her story. I want her wisdom. Yeah. 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 See, I instantly went to amazing chefs. That oh, would yeah. be great to have lunch with because <laughs> yeah, we would have an amazing <laughs> lunch. Yeah. Like well, who, who is it? You can't just say an amazing. I chef. said Gordon oh, Ramsay for sure. Yeah, on he my said part. Gordon. If it was Ramsay. all about just food, Gordon Ramsay. So, oh, yeah. do you know any ancient chefs? Have you heard? No. Any? <laughs> How about you? Do you have any? Negative. That's why. Yeah, all right, we're gonna do some uh, ancient hey, chef and research. Loves Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> if we can get Gordon Ramsay on this show, yeah, my be... little sister Haley is obsessed with. Like uh, Betty Crocker would probably be the oldest. Yeah. yeah. Julia Child. Yeah, yeah, that's the one I was thinking. I meant like way back. <clears throat> do you know anybody, Benjamin? I don't have a clue. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like they had to be there, right? I mean, yeah, yeah we, we, we've always had to like, eat. That's kind of dumb. Hey, right? <laughs> yeah. I've never heard of them dudes. What's up with that? The guy that invented the hamburger. Yeah, but that's like a good cook, though. Yeah. Everyone else is kind of written down. You got athletes, yeah. you got uh, warriors, uh, and everything. That's the thing too. When you think about and who you're going to have eating, the most with. important thing. Uh huh. You'd think we'd remember them dudes. But you can go to any restaurant, but is the conversation with this person that you're having lunch with going to be good? Yeah, usually the chef doesn't even want to talk to you. That's right. Right. That's true. And same thing with celebrities. <laughs> like, I was thinking about some celebrities I'd like to sit down with them, but I was like, eh, would they want to even give me their time or would they be pretentious? Like, who is somebody that would be. Well, if the food's too good, then you're just eating and you're not talking. That's right. right. Exactly. So, is that what we're getting at? Is like, who do you just want to sit there <laughs> so and see? What we need is terrible <laughs> food. <laughs> who do you want to watch chew? Sure. At? I want to see The Rock. Yeah, that's oh, right. Yeah, because he looks yeah, cool when he's eating. Cheat day. Yeah, there you know, go. I mean, that guy looks cool when he's doing everything. He does. <laughs> he always, you know, he always smells like a new car. <laughs> right? There's, there's oh, <laughs> something in that neck. <laughs> you smell like leather. <laughs> yeah, right? His breath smells like a new car all the time. I don't know. It's freaking weird, man. Fresh when he eats, be- it's like a commercial. Yeah. yeah. Marcus and I have met The Rock that for a little awesome. backstory. And he is like, there he's good, always man. perfect. He's good. Yeah. He's The Rock. And he's yeah. so nice. <laughs> All right. All right. We got off. That's a, that's no, it's a good Patreon question. Hey guys, patreon.com slash team never quit. That's where we get to ask these fun questions. You get to get some exclusive swag. We go live from time to time. Uh, It's a lot of fun. We've got a lot lot of new cool things coming y'all's way. So make sure you check that out. Patreon.com slash team never quit. Now it's time to get to the guest because that's what this podcast is all about is interviewing people with incredible never quit stories. 
Benjamin Sledge is a wounded combat veteran who served in Iraq and Afghanistan, mostly under the Civil Affairs and Psychological Operations Command of the U.S. Army. He is the recipient of the Bronze Star, Purple Heart, and two Army Commendation Medals for his actions overseas. Upon returning home, he began work in geopolitical intelligence, then moved into mental health, where he holds multiple certifications and continues to work with veterans. He frequently travels around the country educating businesses, nonprofits, and churches about mental health. Benjamin, welcome to the show, man. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, bro. That's a good resume. Yeah. Sled- <laughs> hey, uh, they, uh, no, it really is. The, the um, Sledge. Any relation mm-hmm. to the Sledge from World War II, Medal of Honor recipient? I can't remember if that dude's last name was Sledge or if his first name. Yeah, happened. it's Eugene Bondurant Sledge. He wrote With the Old Breed. I actually quote him in my book that just came out. Um, well, I, I got on Ancestry and tried to figure it out. Oh, wait, so I'm on point with that? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, cool. Go ahead. Boom. Did you see that? Uh, well, I, I got on, I got on we... Ancestry and it took me down a rabbit hole. And basically I got to a point where I would have had to hire a genealogist. But the, the entire Sledge clan, is all from like the south, <laughs> and he was in Alabama, and, and my side of the claim comes yeah. from Tennessee. We're gonna get along so. great, just by the way you talk, man. <laughs> well, I lived in Texas for eleven years. Too, yeah, well, I can tell, bro, around, just so. by the way you started. I can't see you, man, but I can hear you. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. That's awesome. That's cool, man. Right on. Wait, so he, you got lost, like in Alabama or something, with him? Yeah, I, I couldn't figure out because once you start getting back to your like great grandfathers, everyone's having like seven or eight kids at that point, and then the genealogy trees are just crazy. So they were like, "Yeah, you would have to hire somebody to kind of figure this stuff out." So I don't know. I think it's cool that we both wrote books now, and there's two sledges out there, um, which is fun. So <laughs> we'll see. And I, I wanted my book to be true to like kind of the way that E. B. Sledge wrote it. So. That's yeah. so cool. I yeah, am yeah. obsessed with ancestry. I I just tracked Marcus's like way, way, way back to the um, I mean, fifteen hundreds, and it, it's just really cool. I get I get stuck in the rabbit holes. Like I just keep going and going and going. I love it's it. worth it. I mean, it, well, you what? can understand why you keep up with that stuff. That's why the royals are so fascinating. <laughs> they can track that sucker <laughs> all the way back. Yeah, I can track. Well, my- that. yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh, I was going to say, I am related to a general who was underneath Napoleon Bonaparte. That's That's cool. Because my grandfather hired a genealogist and they were able to kind of trace that back. So we've served in like the sledges have served in basically every major combat uh, operation. I I, I feel like you have to with that name. I I feel like that's just kind of, you know, the sledgehammer is where they at. We're getting into some stuff. You got to bring them them in here. That's really cool. (laughs) And it really shows because I think that y'all are a special breed because, excuse me, and Marcus is as well. Even his mom's side, every single male served in one of the battles in in every generation. There was her dad was in World War Two. Marcus's dad was in Vietnam. Um, and I mean, literally like the Civil War, the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812. He had a direct line to someone that fought in every war. I thought that was really cool. Some scrappers. Oh. Yeah. As a matter of fact, <laughs> we don't, this isn't an absolute 100% for, uh, fact, but West Point, can we say this? Yeah. Oh, well, I-, I actually did hire a genealogist because yeah. I'm, I'm very curious. I got to a point where it's, says something but i don't know if it's true or not um but it says that one of the direct lines that marcus i want everybody to pay attention to this next (laughs) line right now and i mean pay attention very carefully um colonel john west that west point is named after would have been his ninth great great -granddaddy. granddaddy how about that if yeah. that turns out to be true, West Point, yeah. I better have a room down there because you got some bastard sons who are Navy SEALs and I'm going to have a ball. Yeah. And one of them just became a congressman. Yeah, I need if to. That turns out to be true. Well, we don't know yet. I don't know yet. I, I put that out. I didn't say it was true, but if by chance. Yeah, I did my pay the money to get that traced because I don't want to make the claim without I'm it not making right. it. I'm just putting it in the wind. The other stuff uh, I do know for a fact, though. Everything else is lined up pretty good. Yeah. That one would be an awesome pre- Christmas <laughs> present. Well, okay. I, I got one for you. Send my yeah, my grandfather, who's a paratrooper with the 82nd World War II, and he was General Patton's Scotch supplier during the war. What? Dude, that's How an cool. awesome story. Yeah. That, man, yeah. those are the- it's, it's in the book. I tell the story. It's, it's freaking hilarious. He basically... 
him and his buddy hijacked a mortuary affairs vehicle, uh, filled it to the brim with Johnny Walker red, and then took it back to the Oak club and celebrated. <laughs> and Pat and Good for in. them, dude. Good for oh them. Oh my gosh. That's wow. awesome. All right. All right. Let's back it up a little bit, brother. Where, where are you come from? Tell us about your people before we get into the whole, uh, military thing. Let's back it up. Sure. Well, uh, just kind of back. I grew up in Oklahoma. Um, so the, I'm originally from the Tulsa area. And then when I was 18, joined the army. And then after that, it was, it was everywhere, you know, it was, um, Georgia, uh, for Fort Benning and then North Carolina at Fort Bragg, uh, defense language Institute out in Monterey, California. So I was, I was bouncing all over the place. And then, um, eventually Texas for 11 years where I lived in Austin, uh, and met my wife there. And then I moved out to Colorado Springs, Colorado, and am right here on the footsteps of beautiful Fort Carson. Man, dude, that's hold on. Wait, 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 wait a second, man. You skipped over a lot. Go back to where I, <laughs> yeah. I, I got the bending part, but like you've had a, I was trying to catch those bases. I'm starting to be able to do this, like match the bases <laughs> to the locations. Yeah. And you said Monterey, that DLA is in Monterey, California. That's yeah. probably one of the most beautiful That's places correct. around, right? Yeah. Yeah. Good work. It was awesome. <laughs> Your brother did <laughs> a My brother did a stretch there. That's how I know about it. Yeah. That's awesome. So when you grew up, did you have brother and sisters? Did your dad serve? Give us a little background on that. So my brother and I both enlisted. My brother was a combat medic, um, very sim- similar to you and your brother, uh, Marcus. And uh, so we we always felt that call. It also was a way for us to pay for college. But my dad tried to enlist in the Air Force during Vietnam and was barred because he had asthma. So um, he he tried to, but both my uncles were in the Army. Uh, my grandfather, Army, you know, and like we said, it just it keeps going back and back and back. So it was just kind of this thing that that we did um, as fa- as you know. You get pressure the from the family in that, or is it just kind of like a, if you go in, you go in. If you if you don't, you don't. Um, there, I would say it's it was more kind of like honor driven for us. Like yeah, yeah. I saw my grandfather, and you know, saw the photos of him basically looking like Band of Brothers, where he had photos of him jumping yeah, right. out of airplanes and stuff, and. Um, I still have, you know, his photos right outside here where it's, it's him in uniform. He's with his buddies during World War II. And there was just always kind of that collective call. So it would have felt, I don't know, maybe almost like guilt if we didn't, yeah. <laughs> but it, it was never pressed upon us in any way, shape or form. It was just something that the men in the family did. That's awesome. Yeah. That's how, how it was with us. So you, what was your, what did you go in as? How'd you pick army? I, yeah, and y'all yeah, have across I, the board, I, right? <laughs> Obviously, you got different branches. That's the same thing with us, kind of. So, it's how, how did you get motivated for army? Because I tell everyone to join the Air Force now. <laughs> I do too. I, that's not I, even that's a right. joke. And people I laugh at us when we do it. I, bro, I'm telling you, man, people laugh at us when we say that, but I don't know why. Uh, I'll tell you this, the minute they get me the exoskeleton stuff, I'm going oh. in the Space Force. Are you kidding me? <laughs> hey, I'll be right there with you. I'm a, oh, yeah, they got the exoskeletons that can put these bodies back into line. I'm, I'm in there, man. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's on. You need uh, some guys with some bad yeah. attitudes to send in some space? We got some in our generation, for sure. Yeah, I'm like, give it, get, put me up in space. We'll fight some aliens. Just give me the exoskeleton. Suit. I'm in. <laughs> so. Yeah, right. In order to get that, I have to go do that. Okay, cool. I'm in. Yep. Yep. Oh, my God. So what was the question again? I'm sorry. Sorry. So you go into the Army, and what did you decide you wanted to do there? Or how did you get selected to what you eventually ended up doing? Yeah, because that's a unique path you got, bro. I mean, your qualls. There's not a lot of y'all running around. Yeah. Well, this is is the funny part. So (laughs) um, originally, I had, like, the Marines kind of, of, of scouting, and they came over, and they talked to my parents. And that they scared them. And my parents were like, nope, nope. You know, they, they're they the first that are sent out. And I was like, they're like, just, you know, talk to the army. That's what your grandfather was in. And I was like, all right. Because uh, I had, had grown up having the posters in my room, you know, the be all you can be, the, the Semper Fi, the whole nine yards. And, you know, that's that's that was Cold War era, you know, 80s and 90s. So for me growing up. And so in 1999, um, they... I, I scored really high on my ASVAB and was in advanced placement classes for school and, and, and everything else. And uh, they said, hey, there's this group called Civil Affairs and the Psychological Operations Command. It falls under special operations. Are you interested? And I was like, that sounds pretty cool. <laughs> and I joined that and stayed in, in that 
you know, pipeline the entire time. So it was like, uh, went to, went, you know, to school of infantry at Fort Benning, Georgia over at Sand Hill there. And then, uh, went over to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where I went to the John F. Kennedy special warfare center in school. And then after I had completed that, I, I went over to uh, defense language Institute in Monterey, uh, California. And by that point it was, you know, 2002 and the towers had just fallen. So like everything changed, mm-hmm. but the army hadn't changed fast enough with it. And we were in Southcom, which, which runs missions in, in South America. And so they gave me the choice of Spanish, French, or Portuguese. And I was like, well, Spanish is going to help me out in the long run. And, and so I learned Spanish and I'm not kidding you. I get, I finish at defense language Institute and three months later, they're like, all right, we're going to Afghanistan. And I was yeah, like, right. this does not help me. <laughs> yeah. language skills. I remember when I that literally happened. got foreign language for uh, foreign language proficiency pay for speaking Spanish in a, uh, you know, Southeastern Asian country where they spot, you know, uh, where I was at was predominantly Pashtun. So yep. it made zero sense. All right, guys, let's take a second to thank our sponsors over at FitBod. If you have a hard time building a workout routine, you guys should not be spending a ton of hours on research doing that. And keeping things challenging shouldn't mean buying even more gear because you can get a great workout with pretty much nothing nowadays. If you guys haven't heard of FitBot app, it is literally one of my favorite sponsors of the show and honestly an app that I've been using every single day. The FitBot app creates a workout routine that adapts as you improve and uses the equipment you already have so you can reach the next level without burning through all your free time or cash. And I know you guys obviously can't see me right now, but I've got the app open on my phone right now. This has been really one of the coolest apps that I've used in a long time, especially for workouts. I've used a lot of different fitness apps over the years. This one is really cool because you have the ability to set a couple different things up that I think really make it special. One, you can create multiple profiles of where you're working out. For example, your house versus a public gym, for example. And not only can you create those profiles, you can specify what gear you have in those individual locations. What I like about that is I don't ever have to go to the gym going, oh, what am I going to work out? Is it it back day? Is it leg day? I don't have to think about that because I literally just choose the profile of what gym I'm at, whether it's my home gym or the public gym, and it automatically spins up a workout for me based on the gear that I have available. And not just that, it's also looking at my past workouts to make sure that I have got fresh muscle groups. I'm not going to overwork one area of my body. Another thing I like, secretly, there are some days that some workouts just don't sound fun. For example, I've got my workout here in front of me today and Russian twists are one of the supersets today for the ab section. I can actually do this long right hold and click replace and I can switch that workout to any other workouts that are going to help with the abs and the lower back. Things like scissor kicks or side bridges or sit-ups or uh, even a bicycle crunch. So that's really cool too is that if you see a workout or an exercise that you're like, eh, I'm just not feeling it today, or maybe you're not, that's not your favorite workout overall, it's really easy to swap it out. I really love how easy it is to spin up a workout inside of their app. All you have to do is add in your equipment, pick your fitness goal, and FitBod will create the routine for you. Whether you've been missing gym time or you've hit a plateau, a fresh start has seriously never been easier. The app switches up your exercises that's going to avoid overtraining or burnout, and your program changes based on your personal progress for maximized results. And a full year of FitBod is less than the cost of a single session with a personal trainer. That is crazy. I have hired trainers over the years, and I know just how expensive they can be. And the fact that you can have a personal trainer in your pocket is incredible. If you guys want to check it out, if you want to use it, uh, I I really do think it's amazing. You can join FitBod today and build a routine that grows with you without slimming down your wallet. Get 25% off your subscription and try the app for free at fitbod.me slash TNQ. That is fitbod, F-I-T-B-O-D dot me, M-E slash TNQ, F-I-T-B-O-D dot M-E slash TNQ. Gosh. How about that? I remember when that yeah. happened, when they did that shift. Uh-huh. And then every, everybody yeah. was going went for the DLI, was going for the South America kind of deal. So I do not come from a military family. What does the Civil Affairs Psychological Operations Command mean? What do y'all do? Sure. So um, we were birthed out of a need from the Green Berets, the special forces, uh, where effectively civil affairs specifically minimizes civilian interference on the battlefield. And 
a lot of times you're going to hear that we're the touchy feely ones that do the hearts and minds. But the reality is, is we're geopolitical experts. And that comes with knowing the history, the background, um, how foreign policy is dictated by geography, the historical context of everything that's going in there. And then also the, the human part to it, the gathering of human intelligence to advance the commander's initiatives on the battlefield. So, and so really, we are experts in everything that we do um, and everything from reconstruction efforts to, you know, sometimes door kicking. And so we would oftentimes get attached to different, um, you know, infantry line units to um uh the uh the seals like uh we when i was in ramadi uh marcus i think we were, yeah, we were there Absolutely. at the exact same time yeah, yeah. during the battle of ramadi from yeah, 607 um so so that that and we we advise and so we get to see kind of the best and worst parts of war where we're able to effectively reconstruct but also we're oftentimes we're the first people in the door because either we have an interpreter we have the language skills so you either get make a lot of friends or get shot at is what I tell people. And so that's that's kind of how it how it happens is um, is making sure that, um, you know, that that everything that the infantry and the door kickers need to get done is done while moving that civilian populace out of the way and then also engaging in those reconstruction efforts and then handling the d- diplomatic aspects of it as well. He's in charge of basically boil that all down and see that. They're the guys that get in your heads from yeah. from the outside, not even talking to you, to all the way to where he if they have to kick in your door and go in and, and do a face to face. They're the ones that get yeah. They they drive the populace. Like you got Marines, everyone goes in. Some people are good at destroying buildings. Some people are good at this and that and the other. These guys get in and completely shift the narrative of the populace's thought process. So how yeah. was getting into the hearts and minds of the Afghanis? Cause there's their culture is so different than ours. And I yeah. know this firsthand because we, um, I mean, I even have spent significant time with, um, the Afghani who was one of the guys who rescued Marcus. Um, so I know <laughs> that the, the culture is just so incredibly different. Um, how do you learn how to talk to them and how to get them to trust you? Yeah. Um, the, the big thing is, is the difference between, uh, Afghanistan and Iraq is, is major. Um, Afghanistan kind of stopped progress in like the 1500s, which you can easily see. Whereas Iraq kind of looks like it stopped in the seventies because of Saddam Hussein, um, with Afghanistan, you have to understand that it's a very tribal area. They have no national allegiance, which is why when the fall of Kabul happened, the the Afghan militia, the Afghan National Army just rolled over and died uh, because they have kind of lived this live and let live. Like, let me you know, pay my feudal homage to the tribal warlords of whatever area that they're in. Um, and you have distinct areas that have never been conquered, like Missouri stand, which is kind of this own autonomous region. And so realizing that culture and history plays very big into the Afghan um, populace, it, you have to begin to really uh, just understand how they like to operate. And one of the ways that they like to operate is just kind of through no allegiance to anything, mm-hmm. um, which was bizarre. That, it, makes, yeah, watch. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense to me because I, I didn't know that. And I saw it firsthand that, you know, one minute you can be like brothers, best friends. And the next minute it's, oh, well, somebody else offered something. Money, uh, yeah, more so, money. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I just didn't understand that. And it, it at first it hurt my feelings. <laughs> and Marcus was like, you don't understand that it's not a personal thing. That's just mm-hmm. their culture. And it didn't phase him at all. But for me, it was really, really difficult to just to grasp that cultural difference. And it took me a while just to let it go. But it's crazy how different. Yes, I know we come from completely different backgrounds and all of that, but how different just human interaction and and trust and love and all of that works just right. from a cultural standpoint. I mean, uh, you're, that's a tribe mentality separated by mountains. And I didn't know this, yeah. but back in the day when Alexander swept through there 
And then you, you can you can see his swath from Greece all the way over and his all those towns of Alexandria and Alexandretta, Alexander. <laughs> I didn't know that Kandahar or was it Kabul? I'm gonna mess one of the I one of those. It, it used to be Alexandria. And yeah. you know what they called it before that? The name for it uh, translated Candyland. And and you and I both know why they call it that. <laughs> Cause, cause, yes, I do. You know what I'm talking about? And I, I and if you if you trace that in Afghanistan, is it after Genghis Khan swept through there, right? That's how that that came into play. Mm-hmm. So those swaths that came down from Greece and cut through there, man, they all stopped there. Yeah, it's called the Great Guard of Empire. Rough folks, man. Them suckers are tough up, boy. Yeah. I'm talking like mountain goat tough. Yeah, mm-hmm. my dog, hats off to you, brothers. <laughs> <laughs> I had to save my ass, bro. It's Man. so crazy. It's like living history. You know, like, I mean, right. I'm talking now, way back, way, 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 way back. back. Like, like if you want to go history. back in time, that's possible. Yeah. Like when you can travel back in time, when we traveled to Italy the other day, when you feel that that jet lag, <laughs> man, that's kind of like traveling back. The only thing is, is you go forward in time to go back actual in time. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and you can drop right. your, your butt in Afghanistan and see what it was like for sure. And you nailed it. With the 70s for Iraq, and it's almost like the 50s for Cuba, right? Right. Okay, check. Yeah, exactly. All right, right. That's so crazy. So can you tell us a little bit about your work in Iraq and Afghanistan and the difference between those? Sure. Um, So when I, I ended up in Afghanistan in 2003. So like I said, right after we had just invaded Iraq. And so like the U.S. media, I of Sauron had shifted over to Iraq and Afghanistan was just kind of suddenly became this forgotten war, even though I was on the border. Um, I was in a place called Organi and Shkin, which is, is right on oh, the, the uh, border of Pakistan. So it's it, it was a party. And I've been there. In- <laughs> yeah. Yeah, bro. I, <laughs> so I was living in like GP medium sense. And the, for all the talk of, you know, us being so strategic in the military, we pick the dumbest places sometimes to, to set up bases where we literally give the enemy strategic advantage points. So the, the city of Oregon is between these two mountain ranges. And if you've seen the outpost or kind of Restrepo, it's, it's very, very similar to where they would just rein in, you know, 107 millimeter rockets and uh, just, you know, do complex attacks on the base. And so when I arrived there, the 82nd had, uh, had, had been in charge and then they left and then, the uh, 10th Mountain Division came in and uh, took over command of the battle space. And on my base were, you know, everyone from we had, you know, the conglomerates of, of SEALs and Green Berets and CAG guys and all the, the super secret squirrels. And so they were doing their thing. And then we would work with a, a team of, of um, you know, Green Berets from uh, third group. And then the next thing I know, I'm working with special activities. And then I'm supporting an infantry line unit. I mean, it was all over the place because it was realistically, it was, it was kind of the wild west. And so when I got there, uh, we were focusing in on at the time getting girls schools up and started because that was, that was the big push. That was the the narrative at the time. Like, let's get women educated. The problem was, is every time we build a school the the Taliban or Al Qaeda would come in and just blow it up. Um, so it created a, a lot of just different tensions and we weren't really sure if the locals wanted to, um, actively be a part, a, a part of this. But th- the thing was, is that this was, mind you, the first time that I had been in a combat theater, um, I had, like I said, joined the money or joined the military because of the history and then also for college. And so I'd come from this very like leave it to beaver lifestyle, like that 90s sitcom, like, you know, family matters, life is good kind of thing. And when you start to begin to see death and destruction at a level that high, it really flipped a switch in me. And I really began to kind of struggle with like, what is the purpose of the human condition, because, uh, all I could see was, you know, we, we were really good at killing each other. And that's the first time I saw death and destruction up close firsthand. And when you, when you kind of begin to experience that in war, you, you do this self-protective thing where you almost become a nihilist at some, some level. So I, I became very hardened, um, while also trying to win the hearts and the minds of the locals there and create impact and lasting change. But really, my Afghanistan deployment was marked by a lot of combat uh, because we'd be out doing these patrols. We'd be talking to locals and then we would turn a blind corner in a wadi and just get hit. And so on December 10th, 2003, uh, during Ramadan, the uh, Taliban and Al-Qaeda operatives launched a complex attack on our base and I got wounded in combat. So, 
Well, <laughs> most people don't understand that when they when they see those outposts that they set up. Yeah, it's 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 a locational thing, but also we do that. They we know they know where we're at. Yeah, we set that up on purpose to pick a fight. One, so they'll bring all the the ammunition over to that spot to throw at us, and they'll go out and dig up all the other ordnance just to throw us. So that gets rid of it for the populace. So one of the ways that we help the populace is they bring stuff to shoot at us instead of them. We just give them some place to fight because ultimately they'll outlast us over there. I mean, it's hard. You're talking about taking all the guys from our generation, the 90s Gen X, right? And throwing us back in time into Babylon and, and Afghanistan. I mean, all the way back. Right when we were, when you said it, we were kind of melting together. There were some guys that, that everyone signed up, like after 9 11, because we got hit here. So we, we all went over there together and tried to figure it out together. It wasn't, it wasn't like everyone thinks where the Marine Corps went in. Yeah, we had that, but most of the time, man, it was a hodgepodge, of, like a gypsy yeah, camp. Hodgepodge. I mean, they would throw us together and fly. And the thing about the great part was, you got to imagine, we were kids. <laughs> yeah. Bro, can you believe that? We were kids. I'd be right out of college or high school. Yeah. Or, or, I was 20, 21 when I first got there. Right. Yeah, me too. A Same here. Ball cap and a beard. Ball cap and, and beard. The back of a, a Toyota Hilux with some Same CIA thing. contractors thinking I'm cool. And yet I'm literally have no idea what I'm doing. Bro, hey, same <laughs> so, thing. Same thing. And I thought that was the sexiest thing. It was like, just like out of the movies, Jason Bourne. Yeah. We were like, here we go. Here's our CIA guy. They're real. But then we had to figure out how to work together. And, and I'm talking about oh, when you say Wild West. That's not even a, that, the Wild West yeah, wasn't even initi- invented by the time, you know, they sent us way, way back. Yeah. It's yeah. like, oh, here's fat stacks of cash, figure out some intel. Ah. I'm like, well, that doesn't work. Like, let's. And let's they know what thing. we look like. It's not, it's obvious that we uh-huh. don't, be- that we weren't belonging there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a white dude with beard. That's it. And it's like, oh. <laughs> Yeah. So, but that's the thing. Uh, that's the thing that people don't realize is the beard among the special operations became a, a craze, not because it, it not necessarily out of necessity in Afghanistan is necessity and in, in Iraq it was just a cool guy thing in Afghanistan. Afghanistan right. They will not take you seriously yeah. unless you have a beard, especially in the thing. tribal areas, yeah, tribal because thing. it means you're a boy toy. Yeah. So you're yeah, pure man growing up and stuff like that. that you can't. Well, that's the thing. And we didn't get to any teaching of that is the culture. Like imagine yeah. somebody else yeah. coming over here and then they, they have to live here and operate here. Americans would get pissed the minute somebody kicked in your door and came in there. We just, we couldn't oh, yeah. even imagine that happening here, but that's kind of the way it goes over there. And the streets are the streets, whether they're here or over there. So imagine us walking over there. You got to go in, you got to learn the culture. Like, all right, is it safe to do these people like these kind of people over here? Do these people get up early? Or they go to bed late. Do they drink in this neighborhood? Do they do drugs in this neighborhood? They kill people. They steal. I mean, we got we had to learn all of that. Then you had to learn the laws and the rules because once we hand them in and they hand them back I, I, on top of our own. Right. So there, you, you were asking those kids to go through a lot, plus getting shot at every single day. And then when they would die, we would get in trouble for it. It, it, it is what it turned. It was weird now to talk about it out loud. And but yeah. we made it through there though. So good job. <laughs> I can't believe we made it through there in what, one way or the other. What did you find yeah. was the bit the hardest thing to get through to just accomplish when you were in Afghanistan? Um it, uh, like I alluded to, the hardest thing for me was like there in I, I write about this. Um there's a very distinct smell to death. Uh, oh, the way that I talk about I that. Kinda, yes, there is. The way that I de- describe it, it's it's kind of like rotting meat dabbed with knockoff CK1 cologne is yeah. the best way that I can describe it. It's it, especially if bodies have been out in the sun for too long. Um, and you there's a scene in the movie Fury that is absolutely spot on. And uh, Shia LaBeouf, you know, he cries throughout the entire film, but he takes the new guy aside when they first get there and he goes, wait, do you see it? And the young kid goes, see what? And he goes, what a man can do to another man. Yeah. And when you see that up close and personal, it something changes. And for me, that was the moment that like little pieces in me begin to, to fracture. And the person that everybody knew as this artistic, happy-go-lucky kid um, really began to fracture and, and, and a new identity was formed in order for me to survive. And I found that was by far the hardest thing is to 
And I think this is where a lot of combat veterans come home and struggle. It's not necessarily post-traumatic stress disorder. It's with moral injury. And it's the psychological damage that occurs when you have to do things that violate your sense of right and wrong. And seeing death and like uh, man's insides, you know, torn apart from that close up, it does something to the mind. And, uh, and for me, when I came home, um, that became a real struggle point for me. I can imagine. Oh, yeah. Lots of that. We're all in there together. Mm-hmm. And death, yeah, she does have an odor. You can, when she, when she, show, oh, and it, it, it perpetuates itself, kind of like the Hulk. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. more pissed off we get, the more pissed off we get. And I, I mm-hmm. mean, stuff just kind of, you can feel it leave. And if you got a group of guys doing that, I, I tell people all the time, man, y'all need to be scared to death if our guys just get upset mm-hmm. and like the, yeah. start, start doing what we do. Because I mean, you ain't never seen nothing like it. All right, guys, you know that a couple days ago was Small Business Saturday, and I hope that you guys had a great Thanksgiving. You were out there supporting your local businesses. There is nothing quite as special as knowing that you're supporting a local business owner, their family, their community. And that's why I'm talking about American Giants Day. They have been making high quality clothing right here in the United States for over a decade. One of their flagship products is their classic full zip hoodie, and that thing is is 100% without a doubt the highest quality hoodie I've ever owned. From the the quality of the zippers to the thickness of the arms, the elbow pads. I mean, this is not a hoodie that you're going to tear up after one day working out in the yard. This thing can handle whatever you throw at it. This is seriously a hoodie that you can put through the ringer. Their clothes seriously will make the perfect gift this holiday because every piece is designed to be durable, not disposable. And when you give American Giant, you're supporting the great men and women who make the words American made matter. From the farmers and knitters to the finishers and seamstresses, it's all locally made. And I love that. I actually got a whole box of American Giant gear, including their pullover hoodie, their classic full zip hoodie, and some of their long sleeve shirts. And when I wear the products from American Giant, I'm not going to lie, I kind of feel like a badass because the product just looks good. It's tailored. It's got that modern fit. It's got thick cuffs. It's got thick elbow pads. I mean, seriously, the best quality apparel I've ever worn. Made in the USA. And there's something incredibly important about that. You're supporting the people and the supply chains that power them. You're you're getting better quality. You're getting less waste. You're building a stronger communities. More than making great clothes, they are rebuilding the craftsmanship and community that really make Made in America quality possible. Unlike how most clothes are made today, quickly, cheaply, profitably as possible, the classic full zip from American Giant is made to wear, not wear out. They've got functional details like hard-wearing pre-shrunk cotton, reinforced elbows, structured side panels, custom hardware. I mean it when I say this is quality, you can feel immediately. You're going to wonder why can't all clothes be made this way? No wonder it's been called the greatest hoodie ever made for 10 years and counting. Listen, guys, I'm telling you the long sleeve shirt, uh, that's going to be my new, that's a new staple. That's seriously new staple in my wardrobe because it is so incredibly durable. And that zip hoodie, holy crap, it looks sharp like real sharp. I'm telling you guys the way it fits, the way it looks. I mean, it's just badass. Bottom line. If you guys want to check it out, if you're looking for a great gift for somebody, you know, yourself, or maybe your husband shop gifts that last at American dash giant. Dot com. You're going to get 20% off when you use our code. It's TNQ. Use that at checkout. That is American dash giant.com promo code TNQ. How did your family handle it? it? Sounds like you come from a good family that was close knit. How did they handle the change in you? It, it was difficult. My my parents met, um, you know, at, at Bible college in in Oklahoma, and I grew up in a, a Christian household. And then when I was like seventeen, I was like, "This is all fake. This is a sham." And went on this very long journey, um, which I'll t- I'll talk about later. And then eventually became a Christian later in life. But because I, I realized there's a very spiritual component to war, which we can talk about in a bit, um, that I think a lot of clinicians kind of miss out. But um, you know, they, they didn't know how to handle me when, when I first got home, because I didn't know how to handle myself. And, um, like most veterans, like, you know, I was, I was kind of just drinking myself silly just so I could kind of get the images out of my head. Um, but I was also, you know, I'm this young kid who's, who's 22 at this point, 
um, has been wounded in combat. I'm recovering from that. Um, and I'm hyper vigilant and I'm angry. Like that's, that's the thing is like, and every veteran knows this. It's like, <laughs> it's what like Marcus just said, it, it's that scene in Avengers, like an incredible Hulk. And he's like, that's, that's the, uh, that's the secret cap. I'm always angry. Always angry. It's like yeah. always boiling there under the surface. And if you let loose the dogs of war, it's just, yeah, it, it's a scary thing. And so for me, I was trying to navigate that. And eventually it came to a head when I, I was dating this girl at the time, I like kicked in her door. They start calling the police. Like it's, everything's bad at this point. Um, and my, my roommate comes and he tackles me to the ground and, uh, it, you know, is, is holding me and he's like, what is wrong with you? And I start to cry. And then he takes me home and I wake up the next morning and it's like my roommates and then my parents are there in the room and they're like having an intervention, which is like the worst thing ever. Cause immediately you're defensive. You're like, it's not that bad. And then they're like, you need, you need help Benjamin. And I was like, kind of realized I had hurt everyone that I loved the most. And that's when I, I started getting into counseling and I felt like such a, uh, I felt ashamed because, you know, the mindset in the military at that, at that point was, um, you know, it was kind of an oxymoron to get help. It was like, well, you can lose your security clearance or X, Y, Z. So I, I went to a civilian um, <laughs> just so that I, I could wrestle through that. And it was this woman named Joy who really began to help me process what I had been going through and I got better with, with time. Um, but the, the strangest thing happened to me. Uh, I found myself missing war. And so in 2006, early 2006, uh, my team chief, uh, a guy named Paul Gonzalez, he's still serving in the military dude became an E seven, uh, and then switched over to the dark side. Now he's about to pick over, pick up Lieutenant Colonel. Yeah. I mean, and wow. he's a living legend. Like the dude's absolutely incredible. Um, but he, he approached me and he's like, Hey man, we're putting together a team that's going to one of the most violent cities in Iraq and you're coming with us. And I was like, no man, like you, and I had kind of let him in that some things weren't, you know, okay with me. And I was like, you know, it's almost screwed up my life. Um, and at that point I just recently gotten married and he had had a, he, his daughter was a newborn infant and he just looks at me and he goes, Hey man, um, this war is not going anywhere anytime soon. And he goes, you want to get stacked with a bunch of turds later on and get yourself killed by all means. He said, but if you want to come and hand select your own team, he's like, come with us. And I was like, all right, give Dude, me the end he, of the day. that guy needs to be a and used car salesman. Those guys are great. <laughs> I mean, they can, I, I just, I, I was like, man, you know, I've been drinking a lot. I've got a brand new kid on the ground. I've got married. I don't know where my money's at. You're, you're, you're perfect for deployment. Yeah, <laughs> you know <what> I, mean? <laughs> I did the same well, thing to my guys. They were saying like, "Hey, I just got back." I was like, "Oh, you're perfect. Don't worry, man. It's gonna be great." <laughs> well, that's the thing, you know. You as a kid, your parents always ask you this question: If all your friends were jumping off for bridge, oh, would I hate you that, do it? Yeah, dude, yeah, and you right. go, you go, no, mom, of course not. Here's the problem with veterans: oh, all yeah, your buddies would. are going to war. Guess what you're doing? That's right. I, I failed that question. I was like, I'll jump off that bridge so fast. I'll be the first yeah. one and I'll be hollering down on the way down, even if I didn't know it was at the bottom. If the boys are going, I'm going. Mm -hmm. Marcus is yeah. always Just, yeah, I failed whatever, that one. whatever his friends are doing. Yeah, same. So I, I end up in Ramadi, Iraq in in uh in 06 during the surge yeah, when man. it's the most violent city on earth. And I'm sure you remember uh counted for half of all deaths that happened for the United States Marine Corps from 2006 to 2007 and half of all daily attacks that happened in that country of Iraq. I was there with you, man. Yep. Through that one. That was brutal. I thought that the sucked. Meat grinder. <laughs> oh, it sucked. I mean, every day we'd wake up, you go for the cub report, man, and be like, oh, we lost this. And then they kept mm -hmm. rotating guys in and your battle rhythm in the first three months, the first month and a half, and then the last month and a half, usually when guys start taking heavy, we were taking all through there, especially the yeah. Marines, man. Were you down at Camp Corregidor? Uh, no, but I sent half my, uh, my brother was, so I bastard okay. off about six of my guys and sent them out there. I was at shark base. <laughs> oh, okay. You were right there at Camp Ramadi. Yeah, I was, right, yeah, I, Camp I was over at shark base talking to you guys, like, uh, the seals from team three. And then also the Rangers who were there at the time. Right. Right. So, so they had, they, I wonder if we ran into each other. We did. We, we absolutely did. Cause I ripped three out. Mm -hmm. I was on the ad okay. on the advance that came in and ripped because we had to bust through that striker battalion. Yeah. To, just to yeah. get in there. Sure. Oh, oh, yeah, I was oh, down yeah, in same spot, uh, bro. Top Steel area. That's right. I spent most of my time. Well, I spent yeah. a lot of time at Steel myself. 
Yeah. Uh, Marcus was team five at that time. Yeah, I came in with five after that. And then yeah. when, when they started rolling all the Marines in after you guys, because y'all, dude, y'all, y'all were going through some stuff, bro. And then when yeah. we came in, they, they sent in like four Fox, like a bunch of Marines came in off the Ards, and we just laid waste. And I was fighting every single day there. That was a scary yeah. place. Yeah, it's well. super scary. And like, uh, you know, the thing that I tell people is I was like, I was running a, a civil affairs team alpha, which is your a four man team. And we walked out with five bronze stars and two of them had valor devices on them. <laughs> Everybody Just, got their asses kicked there. Everyone got Every, their asses dude, It wasn't one of those deals where you went out and did the dun da da da. No, no, no. That was the <laughs> grinder, bro. It was like whatever was left, you want to get some? Like you want to be a, a G-Watt. Like a global war on terror, a gangster with overtime. If you see a dude walking around as a GWAT, stay the hell out of his way, especially if he's an 06, 07, like 08 Ramadi dude. Uh huh. Yeah. No well, one came out of there. Un- I took 18 guys back with me and all of them got hit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Team three got, dude, you know, they lost yeah. a bunch. Yeah. It's, I mean, it was, it was gnarly. Um, and, you know, I, the, the tough part is, is the guys that came home, you know, some of them were never the same. And some of them lost their lives due to, to unfortunately, suicide. Like even the priests that uh, I yeah. was close with over there. I like so, that, right? That was bad. Um, and the priests started yeah. killing themselves. Oh my gosh, that's terrible. How about that? Yeah. It was bad. It was so it was, it was bad, man. Like it's so bad that the Marine Corps this year for their birthday message, they were talking about these famous battles and they're like Iwo Jima and, you know, and then they're like, and Ramadi. I Are you like, kidding oh, me? So we made the Marine battles? Now. Is that true? <laughs> That's a yeah, big if you is that true. Hey, go look up the Marine Corps message. I'll send you the timestamp oh. later. I was like, because well, now all I, my Marine Corps buddies hollered at me for uh on Marine Corps birthday at you know, just of course to give me hell. Yeah, but oh, they, yeah uh, obviously. But That's they were like, they hey, we got a shout out for Ramadi vets this year. I was like, no way. Really? So yeah. I feel good now. My mouth made my damn day. <laughs> hey, yeah. You're getting a tussle with the core man while they're going through one of their big battles. That's the ones they remember. That's yeah. a big deal. Can Fallujah, you, but Ramadi now. That's cool, man. Sorry, we're on a on a time. Oh, I'm thing. sorry. So I, oh, I want to yeah. ask, what um can you tell us how you found your faith? Yeah. So it's it's like I said, um, and this is this is an important part of the, the book. And the, the name of the book is Where Cowards Go to Die. It just um just won the New York City Big Book Award and it's up for about four other awards right now. Congratulations, um, man. And there, there and this ties into all of it. I wanted to tell a story because one of the things that I, I noticed was um, a lot of books right now aren't focusing on what happens 10 years after the events when veterans come home and they want to die or they're, they're not readjusting. Um, and then the, the complexity, the humanity and the barbarity of combat that encapsulates so much. And so when I was overseas um, and I began to kind of just see, you know, the human condition, um, I was like, what is the point of human existence? Because it seems like we're really good at, at, at wounding, maiming and killing each other. And the, that was the, the existential question that I really began to wrestle with. Like, okay, you know, if the entropic heat death of the universe, cause it was kind of this nihilist and scientific, scientific academic at the time who wasn't really sure of anything. Um, and begin to see that like, okay, if, if the universe ends in 3 billion years and we as a species seem to exist, like, what's the point of anything that we do? And why do wars matter? Why does saving people matter? And I kind of just took this pessimistic kind of look at life. Um, but that also sent me on a journey. And so I started studying like other major world religions and found it very, very interesting. But then I mess, met this priest while I was in Ramadi. Um, and I, funny enough, I had drank a bunch of bootleg liquor gotten super wasted at my hooch and the chapel was right there on base. And I got mad at it um, just because of my upbringing or whatever to the environment we were in. And I chunked this empty liquor bottle at it and it didn't get far anywhere. So the next morning I come to pick it up and I, you know, dispose of it. And I, I walk, curiosity gets the better of me. And I walk into this chapel and all of a sudden I hear this, um, you know, can I help you, my child? And I like whirl and almost pull my <laughs> weapon on the dude because I wasn't expecting anybody. And it's, it's this priest, his name is Father Dennis Rochford. And uh, he's a Vietnam veteran yeah. and he's one of six dudes in his company to survive the Tet Offensive. Oh, wow. Oh, and wow. dude was an infantry grunt, a Marine in Vietnam. He got wounded in action during the, the Tet Offensive. And I was like, this guy's legit. 
So I start talking and I start asking him questions and he kind of just plants some seeds and tells me to explore a little bit more. And then he goes, he goes home, his tour of duty ends. And then eventually I go home. And what ends up happening is, is my wife leaves uh, while I'm in Iraq. It was one of those typical army stories where your spouse just takes off. And, and that was that, um, you know, and, and so I kind of spiral and I start reading the Bible that this priest gives me for comfort. And then eventually I get home and, uh, I start living on, uh, my bed cause I'm, I'm, you know, processing out and start into the reserves. And, um, I start living on my best friend's couch in Austin, Texas, cause I have nowhere to go. And, uh, he can just kind of tell that I'm getting worse and worse. And he's trying to take me down to sixth street to party. And, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm crying in the showers in the morning. I've lost the person I love the most. I'm home from war. I don't know where I belong anymore. I don't really have any prospects as far as anything. And, uh, he just looks at me one day and he goes, Hey man, can I take you to church? And I was like, what's that going to do for either one of us? Because he was an atheist, which was really insane to me. Wow. Um, and so he takes me to a church in Austin, Texas. And, and I just met people who wanted to walk with me through what I had been through. Um, and it was, it was called gateway and uh, a guy named John Burke. He pastors there, a really close friend of mine now. And uh, they just began to really help me walk through the the traumatic experiences that I had gone through um, in war. And what I didn't realize at the time is that war really is a spiritual experience. Like we all like to think we know what comes after death. Like we all think we know, even myself included, but there's like no formative consensus. It's like, do I go to heaven? Uh, Is it a cycle of reincarnation? Is it the great nothingness? But here's the thing. When you point an M4 carbine rifle at a man and you pull the trigger and you send him into the great unknown, there's something deeply spiritual about that because you have the power to protect life or take it away. And on some level, it's like playing God. And a lot of veterans are not exploring this nuance in the issues that they face because human beings are complex and we encompass the intellectual, the moral, the existential and the spiritual aspects and emotional aspects that we all go through. And so instead, like, you know, we're going to the VA and taking pills nonstop and everyone's getting drugged out of their mind, as opposed to what does it look like to explore like all the avenues? And so for me, when I began to explore the spiritual aspect, I found it intellectually satisfying and emotionally stimulating. And so I was like, I'm, man, I'm, I'm in, I'm, I, I think I'm a Christian. And actually I used some curse words at the time. Uh, and I still, I mean, I still will, but I, I literally said, oh shit, I think I'm a Christian one day wow. after having attended this church and being with these people. And um, it, it really just changed the trajectory of my life. And I wanted to give my life um, the same way that, that the priest did in service of others to help them explore healing and take those next steps as veterans coming out um, into the work world. And then also what does it look like to live courageously in life and carry that warrior ethos into career family relationship, never give up, never accept defeat, never leave a fallen comrade behind. That's tough. I mean, you can boil it all the way back to hunter and gatherers. I mean, they mm-hmm. put it in the military where both of those are in there. And if you get a gatherer out there for I mean, they. You can see it when someone has to kill something, even an animal on the road. Some people, t- they start crying when they think about it. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, we got some of our guys. That it's not a problem. Right. It's just it's yeah. not, and that's, it's that's not a problem at all. Matter of fact, it's probably why the Sixth Commandment says don't kill, because we got dudes down here that'll do it all the time. Mm-hmm. They, they, they would do it all the time. That's their sin code. They don't have a problem with it. But th- that's why there's rules. Yeah. And, and we, you meet those guys. They're, yeah, kind of, they're kind of scary on the battlefield. They're where you're freaking, just like, oh. Wow, they're awesome to watch. Here's, <laughs> yeah, they're here's awesome. The <laughs> when you see them before battle, this is the thing. It's like having a, a performance car that you've never seen run. Mm-hmm. And then, and you kind of tell which guys can do what. And then there's those variables. Like You, you look at one dude, you're like, man, I, I never would have expected you to be able to do that. And then as soon as you see them go into action, it changes the way you look at them. And yeah. then when they mm-hmm. come offline, you realize how dangerous something is. You're like, all right, all right, man. And then they started feeding us. Like, oh, there were two wars going on, man. There's plenty of plenty to eat for us.
If you're listening to this Gerber Life Guaranteed Life Insurance sponsorship ad, there's a good chance that you're alive. And if you're not, well, this may not be of interest to you. Now, I know what you're thinking. Life insurance? I'm going to live forever. Death is what happens to other people. Well, for the sake of argument, let's assume you're wrong and that someday you won't be listening to podcasts anymore. I know it's not easy to talk about, so I'll do the talking. If you're 50 plus and alive or 50 to 75 in New York, you can apply for Gerber Life Guaranteed Life Insurance with guaranteed acceptance regardless of your health. And since this life insurance is guaranteed, you don't have to get a medical exam. In fact, you don't even have to fill out a health questionnaire. For a free quote, just visit GerberLifeFamily.com. Then when you stop, I mean, if you stop listening to podcasts, your family can use the insurance money to help cover your final expenses or anything else. Your kids already inherited your ears, allergies, and questionable singing voice. Don't make them inherit your final expense tab too. See website for terms and restrictions. Well, what's interesting for me to sit back and watch this, I... I wasn't married to Marcus when he was in the teams, but all of his friends, even brother, was still in when when I did marry him. So I got to see deployments and experience that through all of them. And there's a couple of them that are like that, that are just those break glass when needed kind of <laughs> guys that, I mean, really have no care in the world if, if they're going to kill somebody or how they do it or whatever. And it's super interesting in the last couple of years, a lot of them have been going um, and doing these medicinal treatments. And yeah, and with a friend who runs one and within doing it, they're actually finding God. And yeah. I, as a lifelong Christian, I, I was so mesmerized by that and that, and I started to do my own research in it because it, here's a man that I met you know, 12 years ago or whatever, not Marcus, but one of his friends. And he was as cold as ice. I mean, eyes black, just as cold as ice. And now has a family, has, you know, just life in his eyes, not drinking, not taking pills, um, not doing any drugs. I mean, he's really just living life and living life for God. And I'm like, how does that happen like you know what that does it sets up a lot of great examples it's like hey man you've run across some of our guys and gals there's something in there worth pulling out yeah i mean that, a lot of our, the, the greatest people man when they get shoved down into a bad spot they just that it, it, it encapsulates them well and the whole point of me even saying that is like finding god i mean yes they had to do some some crazy stuff to find him but in or they the end is that they ended up finding god through that and even though they went through war and went, I mean, literally went through hell there, it's really neat seeing all these warriors now warriors for Christ. I just yeah. think that's so, so freaking awesome. I got a question in psyops. You, a lot of training goes into everything <laughs> you pick up, right? I mean, you got like the one that a couple of y'all that run around with us, man, y'all were great. Dude, y'all can mess with people like you can't believe y'all are the best tricksters too. <laughs> Anybody can get in your head and mess with you just by talking to you. Don't think they can't have a good. It's funny. I, we're switching that around to where now we you perpetuate it into what we're this side of it. Take it out of war. And how, how long did it take you to turn that around to kind of figure out how to do that? It, you know, it took it took several years. Like yeah. um, I had to get in and do EMDR therapy too, which was a, a really just because the, the memories. You know, a lot of times are traumatic and it reprocesses your brain. But um, the, the key component for me was, so when, when veterans transition out of the military, and it, this will tie it all together, you, we live by that code of conduct where we have each other's back, especially combat veterans, where it's like, I got your back, you got mine, I'd do anything for you, I'm happy to take a bullet. And then you leave that environment, you enter a workforce where the CEO is letting everybody catch proverbial shrapnel in the trenches so that they can make more money. Or the employees are trampling each other on the way to the top. And so veterans feel completely alienated. We're like, whoa, there's no code of conduct. Nobody values my experience or leadership. You know, leaders don't eat last. They appear to eat first in the corporate world. And so it becomes this very jarring experience. And so in addition to, you know, coming home and dealing with that and now entering the workforce, I was like, oh God, how do I handle like all of this? And I had the the thing that I've discovered is when veterans get out, oftentimes they'll head to their home of record from wherever they were in high school or 
or someplace and they don't have a community. They don't have that tribe around them the way that they did in the military. And so for me, I was lucky enough to have people from my church and then my, my one friend um, really kind of just begin to rally around me uh, and then show me the greater parts of life that life could still be beautiful uh, aside from, from what I thought I knew in war. And then also at the same time, explore like that healing, like, hey, why don't you do counseling? I'm, ch- I'm doing counseling. Um, why don't you, you know, why don't you spend time here doing these like intramural sports with us? Let's actually talk about, um, some issues that actually go on in our life as opposed to the, you know, I, hi, I'm fine. How are you kind of moment? And so, because I had, I had that tribe and that community built within from the church and then also, um, from people and then friendships that I began to make, um, with time and counseling, I gradually got better and better and better. And so really for me, it took, it took about three years. I would say, I think it was, it was really, let's see, got home in late 2007. So yeah, around 2010, uh, w- w- I would say was really when, uh, I was marked more by like kind of a sense of peace, a sense of joy in my life, as opposed to just kind of being this caged, you know, animal for yeah. a while. So what are you doing now? Other than the book, are you like, are you counseling people or are you doing any of that? Uh, so one of the things I do now is I, I'll train. I train a lot of entities and organizations on like, hey, I want to train you as civilians as far as like how to handle veterans, because most of us actually really are dying to tell our stories. It burns from the inside, but. Oh, that's what we do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's why we go get those yeah. stories. Yeah. It, the, think about any time Marcus gets around his his buddies that he served overseas with. It's immediate code switch, and we're talking about all the things that happen. We don't care. We're just we're going to talk about it all night, and it's going to be great. And b- that's because those stories live and burn inside of us, and that we want them to get out. But we don't tell civilians those stories because of the fact that we see their body language, and mm-hmm. oftentimes you have to deal with the gallows humor and things that they just don't understand. When you start laughing and you're like, and so this terrorist's heads explode, they're like, oh God. And there's a story I write about in my my own book called Dog Strike, where we're literally just killing dogs. Uh, and so people, and I come home and I tell this story, and I'm not going to tell it to you here because I want you to pick up the book and read it. Um, yeah. But they were they're imagining they're fluffy, you know. Oh and sure. Like, oh yeah. God, this environment's an huge. Yeah. 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 Environment's huge. And so, um, the the thing that I've realized is is that. They're the subtle nonverbals, and we are very good. Veterans are increasingly uh, aware of civilian nonverbals. They can tell when they're uncomfortable, and the message that it communicates is you're a monster. Whereas oh, oh yeah. the people that I was interacting with, you know, they didn't have those responses. They wanted, they wanted to hear more. They felt compassion and empathy. And so I, I've been training. Um, there's a master's program now here at uh, Colorado State University for veterans and first responders. So they've had me in as a guest speaker there. I've trained the volunteers of America to deal with like homeless veterans. Um, I've spoke to the joint special operations command out in, um, you know, Fayetteville, North Carolina. So I'll do everything from keynote speaking to leadership, um, traveling around the country, educating everyone from, you know, nonprofits to businesses. On top of that, I'm a graphic designer and web developer. Um, so I've, I've done that for a real long time. I, I write, I ghost write. I, I mean, I, I kind of became really fascinated when I heard about this guy's name's Jason Neverman. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He, uh, he, he was the bassist for Soundgarden and Nirvana. Oh, wow. And he got kicked. Right. Yeah. He got kicked out of both, became an army ranger and then became a green beret. Oh, good for him. That's a <laughs> <Yeah>. badass. right? There. <laughs> and so he, and everyone's like, how did you kind of come up with this? And now he got, he's in Columbia studying philosophy. And everyone's like, how did, how did you go? Oh, he's from, a true warrior. That? That's a samurai code right there then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what that right. Is. Yeah. And so I, I like to call it, um, I feel inside every man, there's both a warrior and a poet. Yeah. An and, artist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And an artist. And so every, for me, I, I just, there was this thing we used to call it back in the day. It was a Renaissance man. And before that it was a, a polymath. And so I became fascinated with this idea of how can I learn skills and then apply them and kind of make money out of them for, for life. And then at the same time, give back and uh, impact and help other people. And so that's, that's really all I'm doing with my life now. That's awesome, bro. That's, that's really brilliant. cool. Yeah, man. It's almost as if when you go into war, your first battle scenario, we debrief afterwards. 
But then some people needed a two day debrief. And then on that second day, you get into another battle and you try to debrief that one. Just keep stacking up. Like you get guys who keep going. Those things just keep stacking up, go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And the minute you get out, people are like, oh, that's, that's when they show up. And when your buddies show up, they bring certain situations like in a smell too. Those freaking mm -hmm. smells. We all stink. Um, and you were talking about how, <laughs> how people like body language on civilians. It's not only we can see it, bro. You can feel it right when they turn mm -hmm. into it. Because I think it was because we were so afraid when we got over there. I mean, when you, when, you know what I'm talking <laughs> about? True. Like it kicked my spidey sense right on. The minute they dropped me in there, I would I talk about being fear. Oh, my God. Right. And if you're we're like that all the time. Mm -hmm. Like you don't yeah, know how to turn I, your superpower off. You forget how to do that. And it, yeah. it's the craziest thing to watch us come come back on the other side of it now and teaching that like having to pass it down. That's what we got to do. You know, that's good. well. That's why I named my book "We're Cowards Go to Die" because I, I didn't want people to think that, and it ties in at the end. But I didn't want people to get the idea that I was some heroic, like jingoistic. I got this battle thing. Um, I literally start the story out on the day that I get wounded in combat and I freeze. Um, I, I literally freeze because my friend is bleeding out. I'm injured and I don't know how to get to the medics. And, uh, I've already run out under fire once gotten blown up there. And I run back into the room where my buddy's bleeding out. And I just look at the other guy who's with us and I'm like, they, I scream at him, you know, they blocked access to triage. Where the hell do we go? He decides to run out the front door where we've gotten blown up. And I literally told him, I was like, it's your turn to get blown up. But my hands start trembling, you know, and I'm shaking. And all I know how to do is just do the medic work on my buddy. But I couldn't even run out at another time. And that's that's a story that most people won't tell you. Um, and I, I wanted people to see that, like, the fear when it grips you, it, it can be paralyzing sometimes when you're in those environments. And the only thing that kept me moving was knowing that my friend might die. But I, I didn't want to be the guy that everybody was like, oh, he's awesome, you know, and like he he did all these really cool things. Most of the time, I kind of look like an idiot um, because you sometimes you know what you're doing. Sometimes you don't know what you're doing, but you have to talk about that fear. And when the fear hits, it'll either take you or propel you forward. And I've had both happen. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your story. I mean, that's really incredible. And we will definitely order your book. Is that on a, is it available on Amazon or Barnes and Noble? Amazon everywhere major books are sold from what people are telling me they've really been loving the audible because there's a they hired a professional voice actor and there's a broad variety of characters that are fun that you're you're going to get to meet throughout everyone from you know air force guys to to seals to um uh you know army and marines and uh so he has to do a lot of different voices and uh and he does a good job. So if you if you're on Audible, I recommend that. But uh, yeah, nice. any yeah. more major books are sold. Well, we'll definitely. Yeah, order thanks, it. brother, for taking yeah. the time, man. I, that was a good. I could talk to you for hours. Yeah, now we could talk to you forever. We're on a time crunch. Sorry. <laughs> well, Wait. next time I'm in Texas. I'll, yeah, I'll love absolutely. You guys are in Houston area, right? Yeah, we're um, between Houston and Austin, an hour outside of Houston. Um, okay. So, what's your Instagram, or how can pe people find you? Uh, the best way to find me is uh, on Instagram. It's Benjamin C. Sledge. Twitter, it's Benjamin C. Sledge. Um, on Facebook, my, I have uh, about 42,000 followers on Medium, which is a writing platform where I, I write about my experiences often and, uh, and everything there. So if you want to check out some more of just like essays on life or war or whatever, that's where I write. My website's benjaminsledge.com. Or if you're interested in the book, uh, head to... Uh, Amazon, it's where cowards go to die. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, brother. Do you do a comedy yeah. write? Like where you write your the funny, the like the straight up military, what we would get. <laughs> you need to have like a side folder of that, bro. I, I can only imagine what you what you've seen. But hey, thanks again, man. God bless you. <laughs>